Good morning, everybody. Listen, if it's this cold in May, I'm not coming in January. <laughs> Woo! I walked out that this morning, that north wind hit me. I said, where am I? <laughs> Goodness gracious. I understand you have two seasons up here, you know, winter and construction. <laughs> Oh, Father, we bless you and praise you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you honor and we give you glory. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We thank you that as the praise goes up, the walls come down. And we give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Thank you for an anointing today. I receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Pastor, thank you so much. Such a wonderful blessing to be here. I, I was just sitting here or standing there a moment ago as, as you all were worshiping, and uh, I heard the Lord say this to me. You're like a sponge today. You're full like a sponge. Tell the people, just squeeze you out. <laughs> just squeeze. Put your hand up like this and just squeeze. Squeeze everything you can out of me. Get everything you can. I not, only want, I not only want you to be fulfilled, but I want to be fulfilled too. I want to be able to say that I have finished my course. When, that's, when that time comes, 120 years from now, you know. <laughs> Praise God. Um, Sunday, we focused in on healing. And yesterday, we focused in on the Holy Spirit, and God manifested gifts last night. And today, I want to focus in on seed faith. And I want to remind you, as I believe in reminding people, I want to remind you of what the Lord spoke to me through my father, that as I got into my mid and late 60s, and now I'm 70, um, the Lord showed me that I was to teach on healing the Holy Spirit and seed faith, and that I would do it in uh, underdeveloped nations. In just a couple of months, I will be in central India, in the area just south of Mumbai, which used to be Bombay, and over in Bangalore. And I already have 2,000 rural pastors who are signed up for this meeting. They are coming from areas where there is virtually no internet. They have no connection. They have to come into the city in order to get uh, internet, to get online. And most of them have had no training. And they are forgotten. They're out there alone. And they're in the jungle, they're in the mountains, there are no roads, they have to use bicycles, they can't get cars in there. And we're helping them, we're, we're, we're buying bicycles for them. Uh, we're, building, we're building, not orphanages, but places for children and through, through, the, through the churches. And we're also, we've also built several sewing centers for widows who lost their husbands and they have, no, they have no income. And we're training them how to sew so they can get a job. And, uh, uh, and these pastors have done all this and they put my name on it. I've got the Richard Roberts Sewing Center. <laughs> it's amazing. When I see the, when I see the videos and the, and the photos that they send me, uh, because the, our lead pastor there travels about to get all the testimonies. And, and many of these pastors, I was there this past year, we had 1,700 pastors in southern India. And uh, uh, they're now, these pastors in the last six months have begun 300 new churches, in addition to the churches they're already pastoring. And their churches are doubling and tripling in size and they're having crusades and they're having healings. Many of them have never even had an idea that they could pray for the sick. Many of them have never ever prayed for the sick. Now they're praying for the sick, they're having all kinds of miracles. Uh, they're having cancers fall off of people's bodies. And uh, uh, I just got a testimony the other day, matter of fact, uh, of, of, a, of a woman who was just virtually, virtually dead. And they laid hands on her and God healed her and she's now out testifying of the saving healing power of God. So. Uh, that's, a, that's a great part of my life, and I enjoy doing it so much. I, I enjoy imparting. 
I enjoy, I, I used to watch my dad. I, I, watched, I watched people just squeeze everything they could get out of him. And I said, Lord, I, I pray the day comes when, when I'm like that, when, when, when I, I have enough to give that I can just pour out and pour out and pour out and pour out. And so I thank God for, for the opportunity to come up here and to share. And I want to thank Pastor Jay and Debbie for this opportunity to be here. Praise God. The You Fresh Oil churches, you, you, have, a, you have something great going. And it's different. And I appreciate it. Because uh, I've been to some places where you, you know, after the worship, you want to say, when do we view the body? Because it's pretty dead. But thank God, this place is alive. Amen. Praise God. I heard the story about this antique dealer who traveled through the little towns in his area looking for bargains in the small <coughs> antique shops. And one day he was in a little town in this antique store looking around uh, when he noticed a cat that was drinking milk from a bowl. And as he looked, he realized that that was no ordinary bowl. It was a very expensive antique. He thought to himself, this storekeeper doesn't have any idea the value of that bowl. Why, I'll buy it for little or nothing, take it back to the city, and sell it for a great price. And so he walked up to the storekeeper and said, sir, I, I noticed this cat. This cat is so beautiful. I've always wanted a cat. Would you sell me this cat? The man said, well, sure, mister. Just give me $100, and I'll sell anything in the store. The cat's yours, sure. So the man paid him the $100, and he picked up the cat and began to stroke it and said, my, what a beautiful cat. And he said to him, I notice he's drinking milk from an old bowl. It's not worth much. I believe I'll just take that bowl with me. And the storekeeper said, you put that bowl down. That's the best cat seller I've ever had. <laughs> and isn't that the way a lot of people are? Trying to get to one another. But that's not the seed faith life. Amen. Sunday morning I was sharing a, a portion of my dad's testimony and my testimony of how he came to the Lord and was healed of tuberculosis and how I came to the Lord after experience I had in the hospital. And um, when my father gave his heart to the Lord after having been bedfast for five months and Jesus appeared to him in the face of his own father, my grandfather. He said to his dad, reach up into the closet and get the mason jar. For when people had come to visit him and pray for him during those five months that he was bedfast, oftentimes they would give him gifts of money, a dime, a quarter. Now this was 1935. Once in a while, a dollar. And he had gathered uh, money and put it in a mason jar, had them put it at, and kept it in the closet. And the moment he gave his heart to Christ, he said to his dad, Papa, I called him, everybody called my grandfather Papa, Papa, get that mason jar. I want to give an offering unto the Lord. It was the beginning of the seed faith teaching which has spread around the world. But the first one through the wall usually gets the bloodiest. The first one who, who, who comes up with a new idea from God gets hit, yeah. Yeah. gets That's struck right. at. That's right. That's right. And uh, he began to teach on the principles of sowing and reaping, and it was not well received. People got the idea that he was after something from them, not realizing that God was not trying to get something from them, but instead he was trying to get something to them. Yes. And there's a difference. And I remember all of the struggle as I was growing up, seeing all that, hearing all that, reading about that, seeing the, the criticism and everything that came. And I remember when my father wrote the book uh, in the 1950s, uh, My Blessing Pact Covenant with God. And 
He taught that wherever he went. And as a boy, I was in those services hearing that teaching. Then in the mid-60s, I guess it must have been 67 or 68, maybe 68 or so, he wrote the book, The Miracle of Seed Faith. And I thought of this, Pastor Jeff, when you were having me autograph that book yesterday. That book, The Miracle of Seed Faith, which is one of the biggest books that he ever wrote. I mean, biggest in numbers, I mean. Uh, because that book went more than three million copies around the world. And it was, it was, the, it was the textbook of, of the principles of sowing and reaping, seed faith. It's called The Miracle of Seed Faith. And the, remember, the reason I remember it so well is because I typed the original manuscript. We had an old electric uh, uh, typewriter uh, it called a Selectric IBM typewriter. <laughs> Any of you old enough to remember that? We had one. Uh, from, the, from our office and we set it up in the kitchen and my dad would sit in the living room because he wrote by hand and when I write books now I write by hand I, I, you know, it's hard teaching old dog new tricks and so I write by hand but he wrote by hand and he would write a manuscript and then hand it to me and I would go in the kitchen and type it and I'd send it back to him he'd make sure I double spaced it so that he could make changes and then I'd go back and type it again, and then he'd go and edit it and change it, and I'd go and type it again. So by the time I finished typing it, I knew that book backwards and forwards. <laughs> I mean, that book was inside me. I know it as well today because I, I typed, I, it was all part of me, and I typed it. But I was thinking about that when I autographed that book because Pastor Jeff had a, had a copy of it yesterday. But I also remember at that time when his own denomination questioned him on it, and called him up before their board of directors in Oklahoma City and said to him, Brother Roberts, you're not teaching the Bible. And I remember my father saying to them, say that again? And they said, you're not teaching the Bible. He said, say that again. And they said, well, we, we, just, we just said it. Why do you want us to say it again? He said, say it one more time. Well, why would you ask us to say it again because we just said it? He said to them, because if you say it again, I'll never darken the door of a Pentecostal holiness church again as long as I live. And anyone who knew anything about Oral Roberts knew that his word was his bond. And if he said he was going to do something, you could write it down. If he or my mother said to me, when I get you home, <laughs> I knew they would keep their word. <laughs> and I could be good for the next four or five hours uh, before that, you know. He said, say it again, and if you do, I'll never darken the door of a Pentecostal holiness church again. And they said, well, now, now wait a minute, Brother Roberts, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's, let's, let's talk this over. And of course, a two or three hour discussion followed that, but there was such a terrible taste left in his mouth because of the hatred against the seed faith message. Because in those days, many people, especially Pentecostals, believed that if God would keep you humble, the people would keep you poor. And that in order to serve God, you had to have nothing. And they totally discounted the Bible which says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. In fact, prosperity is from Genesis to Revelation. And he came out of that meeting and came back to Tulsa and shared that with us, with my mother and with, with, with us kids. And we were heartbroken because we saw how it affected him. And it wasn't long until he, uh, he removed himself from the denominational world and became an independent. He was always a maverick to begin with because God was always speaking to him. And, and many of the pastors in those days did not want God to speak to him. It wasn't because they were against God speaking. It was because, it was against, it was because the fact that their members... Said to, said to them, how come God speaks to Oral Roberts but doesn't speak to you? It was misplaced anger. And I can remember 
I can remember feeling the daggers come from the pastors who were sitting on the platform during the crusade days. They didn't want to be there, but their, their parishioners, their members wanted them there. And they didn't want to be there because they were asked the question, how come Brother Roberts has miracles and you don't? So it was misplaced anger. See, I grew up in all of that. And I, I saw the hurt that my father went through. As I said, the first one through the wall gets the bloodiest. And when he withdrew his papers, uh, he thought he would be an independent uh, for the rest of his life. But he got a call from Bishop Angie Smith, who was the, uh, the bishop of the Methodist Church in Oklahoma. And my grandfather had been a Methodist pastor. My grandfather had, on, my, on the Robert side, had, had founded uh, 10 or 12 churches, Methodist churches in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And I told you the other day, my, my grandmother was Pentecostal, but my grandfather was Methodist. They were Methecostals. But they believed in miracles, they believed in healing, and they believed everything that you and I believe. And those were very, very tough days. And Bishop Smith called my father and said, I understand that you have withdrawn your papers from the Pentecostal holiness denomination. He said, yes, that's right. He said, we would like you to consider coming among the Methodists. And my dad, being bold, said, well, Bishop, uh, if I do, I will not change. And Bishop Angie Smith, who was a man who was baptized in the Holy Spirit, said, Oral, if you change, we don't want you. <laughs> and in about 1969, I think it was, uh, he became a, an ordained minister again in a denomination through the Methodists. And uh, they wanted two things from him. They wanted him to come to all of their great conferences across America and around the world and teach on healing and the Holy Spirit, and particularly on seed faith. So you see, you see where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm giving you some background so you understand why I'm doing and why the Lord is keeping this going, you know, so that you, you, you don't turn around trying to, to preach some different gospel. And uh, for years, for probably seven or eight years, he uh, traveled across America and around the world to these great Methodist uh, lay conferences, sometimes five, 7,000 uh, Methodist laymen. Uh, and, and of course, he said, you're going with me. You're going to sing uh, because their worship was pretty bad. And uh, he didn't want to, well, it wasn't worship. He, uh, he didn't want to dig out of a hole, so he had me sing in front of, you know, before him. And uh, I would, I, I, he told me where I was going. I said, okay, so I went. And we went all, we went all over the world uh, doing these, these, these conferences, um, teaching on the principles of healing, the Holy Spirit, and seed faith. And there were, there were tens of thousands of Methodists who were baptized in the Holy Spirit in those meetings. And they got a new understanding of the principles of sowing and reaping. And I thought I should share that with you this morning so yes. you'd have some background. Yes. Knowing, knowing where I'm going. And I was talking to Pastor Jay. The, um, I learned when I was in high school, I took a speech class. And my speech teacher said there are three principles of speeches. Number one, you tell people what you're going to tell them. And number two, you tell them. And number three, you tell them what you've just told them. <laughs> Those are the three elements of a good speech. You tell people what you're going to say, then you say it, and then you tell them what you just said. That's bratting the nail on the other side, yeah. getting in you. So I, I thought I'd give you the background of that this morning yeah. so you'd know where I'm coming from. So good. We learn in Genesis that, that the Bible says, as long, Genesis 8.22, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. And from my earliest days, I remember my father preaching on the principles of sowing and reaping. And I can remember... We were in a crusade once, I was just a boy, we're out in the great northwest up in the Spokane, Washington area, and we were driving down the Columbia River Valley over towards Seattle, or, and uh, I guess we were south of Seattle, uh, and, and it was harvest time, and the farmers were out there gathering their harvest, and uh, he would pull a car off the side of the road and teach us on the principles of sowing and reaping. And he would say, a farmer's greatest day is not at harvest, but it's at seed time. Because they know harvest is coming. And they're out there gathering in that harvest, and it's such a beautiful part of the country anyway, the great Northwest. 
and they were gathering in the harvest. And I didn't realize that God was pouring that into me as a boy. And he would tell stories, and I, I think one is particularly appropriate because uh, Iowa being a great corn state, uh, my, my grandfather raised corn among other, among, among other crops. And one day, uh, my dad and my older uncle, Vaden, were taking the big shovels and shoveling the corn into the barn. And my grandfather came out and said, you're doing that all wrong, boys. You're doing that all wrong. And my dad said, Papa, what do you mean we're doing it all wrong? We're doing what you said. You said, take the shovels and shovel the corn in the barn. He said, no, no. You take the big choice ears and you set them aside. That's our seed corn. And we don't ever eat our seed corn. See, things like that have stuck with me. And they're just as appropriate today so that we don't forget our roots and how we're supposed to live our lives. Amen. Genesis 8.22, as long as the earth remains, there will be summer, winter, hot, cold, day, night, and there will be seed time and harvest. Now, a lot of people pronounce it seed time and harvest. But if you pronounce it correctly, it's seed time and and harvest. Now there's a difference. Yes, there is. Seed, time, everybody say seed. seed. Now say time. <laughs> Elongate that now. Time. <laughs> Are you going where I'm going? <laughs> and harvest. <laughs> Lindsay and I were watching TV one night and Jerry Savelle was preaching. And Jerry asked the question on television, what do you call the space between seed and harvest? And Lindsay took off her shoe and threw it at the television and said, You call it hell, Jerry! You call it hell! It's hell! Waiting on that time! You know what I'm talking about. That hell time in there where you gotta wait. That's not what we want. We want a microwave miracle. We want seed time and harvest. We want it in the drive through line. But he said, seed, time, and harvest. There's a period of time. When I was a boy, my mother and I planted a garden in our backyard. And we were digging little trenches, and she saw that I had no idea what I was doing. And so she reached into her pocket and pulled out a, a package of a seed, of tomato seeds, and handed it to me. And I saw those red tomatoes on the cover, the picture. And I looked at her and I said, Mother, is this what it's going to look like? She said, Yes. Not today. Not tomorrow. Not next week. But the day will come. We'll come out here and gather in tomatoes. And I got a glimpse of the harvest. I saw it. And I was out there every day checking on it. Just a little boy, you know. And I saw those little shoots come up out of the ground. And we finally had to put some chicken wire to get the tomato vines to stand up. And saw the little green buds come out. And started turning yellow and then red and the day came when she said now let's get the bushel baskets we started gathering in tomatoes I began to understand this has been in me for a long yes. time this is not a Johnny come lately thing yeah. it's been all of my life I've learned how to plant seed how did this all begin it began with a man by the name of Abraham he was named Abram and his wife Sarah, but God changed their name. So for the sake of today, let's call them Abraham and Sarah. And God spoke to them as they were living in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, which is modern-day Iraq. We hear a lot about Iraq in the news, don't we? They were there. And God said, get up from your kindred and go to a place that I will show you when you get there. Now that is something that I don't know how well we would handle today. If God were to speak to us and say, get in your car, get on the interstate, start driving, 
and I'll tell you where you're going when you get there. But that's exactly what happened. And when they got to the place God wanted them, it turned out to be what we know today as Israel. And Abraham began to prosper and his numbers began to grow. And the day came when uh, his nephew and he got into an argument. And there was a squabble, a family squabble, and they separated. And Lot chose the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, which didn't work out too well for him. And Abraham chose the hard scrabble land and continued to prosper. And the day came when Lot and his group were kidnapped by four marauding kings and their armies. And Abraham sought the Lord and went after them to rescue. And when he brought them back to town, he was met by a man by the name of Melchizedek, who was the priest of Salem, who was a type of Christ. And he offered him, as the Bible says, bread and wine, which was a type of the communion that we receive today, the Last Supper of Jesus. And said to him, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, and the one who delivers him from all of his enemies. Now, up till that point, I do not believe that Abraham really knew who God was. But Melchizedek told him who God was. He was Most High. He was possessor of heaven and earth and the one who delivers him from all of his enemies. And when Abraham understood who God was, that he was most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, and the one who delivers him from all of his enemies, he gave a tithe, which means increase. He gave a tenth of all that he had unto God. That's how it began. Immediately, Satan came to try to wreck the deal. And that's what happens to us. Invariably, when you sow, car will break down, heater will go out, some medical bill you didn't know about to get you to say, Oh, I wished I hadn't done that. Satan comes in immediately to steal the seed. And how did it happen with Abraham? It happened through the king of Sodom, who came and tried to make a deal with him. But Abraham, being strong in faith, at least for the moment, <laughs> said, no, I won't even take a shoelace, lest you say you made Abraham rich. And then he went out scared spitless. Have you ever been scared spitless? I mean, so scared you can't even spit? cotton mouth. You know what I'm talking about? The reason I know is because you move over into the 15th chapter, God had to come to him and said, don't be afraid. Why would God say don't be afraid if he wasn't afraid? Don't be afraid. I am your shield. And I am your ever increasing reward. So the same thing that happens to us happened to Abraham. When he planted that seed, the devil came in to steal it. But he stood strong in his faith. And that's exactly what we have to do. Because when we sow, immediately Satan will try to come and steal the seed and steal your harvest. That's when you have to say, no, devil. You can't have me. You can't have my family. You can't have my finances. You can't have my health. You can't have my emotions, you can't have my job, you can't have my ministry, you can't have my business. No! That's when you draw a line and say, no, devil. This is my house, this is my car, this is my wife, this is my child. That's when you have to get strong. That's what the Bible means when it talks about being violent in your faith. You have to say, no! You have to bind him in Jesus' name and rebuke him and say, take your dirty, rotten, stinking, filthy hands off me. This is how it started. It all started through Abraham. And Abraham prospered. And Abraham was looking for a reward too. And the old teaching said, you don't expect anything from God. You give out of obligation. But 
every time you plant a seed, you have a right to a Bible harvest. Abraham was looking for something. What was he looking for? He said, he said to God, what will you do seeing I go childless? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. He was looking for something. Now, he was looking to God. He wasn't looking to people. Because when you look to people, nine times out of ten, they'll let you down. People make lousy sources. People are instruments. Don't look to people. Look to God. And if you study the Old Testament, you'll find that principle all the way through. You'll see the seed principle. And one of the greatest demonstrations uh, was in the life of David, the king, when he got himself into trouble. When he numbered the people and God was displeased with him because of his sin and sent a death angel. And before David knew it, 70,000 men had died. And David was looking for a way to get out of his present mess. And he saw a man by the name of Ornan who was threshing wheat. And he said, I'll buy the threshing floor, I'll buy the animals, I'll buy the instruments, and I'll sacrifice, which was tantamount to sowing seed in those days. And Ornan saw him coming and tried to make a deal to curry favor with the king. He said, you don't have to buy it, I'll give it to you. David said, no, I would not give God something that cost me nothing. I'll pay retail. I'll pay the full price, which was symbolic of what Jesus would do on the cross when he paid the full price. You see how this all ties together? He said, I would not give God that which cost me nothing. I will buy the threshing floor. I'll buy the instruments. I'll buy the animal for the sacrifice. And when he did, God withdrew the angel who went back to heaven. Remember that angel was standing suspended between heaven and earth with his sword drawn. And God recalled him and the day was saved. Um, and then you see, you see incidents like, uh, like Ahab and, uh, and Jezebel and Elijah who, who said it will not rain until I say so. And you see how he was taken care of after he ran for his life <laughs> down to the brook and, by, and the ravens fed him until that played out. And God said, I've commanded a widow to sustain you in the city of Zarephath. And of course, that's where so much criticism came. When my dad began to preach on Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, as I grew up, you know, you know the, the, the criticism came out. Well, that's typical what a preacher would do to a widow. You know. I remember we once, got a, we once got a letter from a woman. We were under such criticism because my dad and I were preaching about Elijah and the widow of Zarephath and how we were trying to take advantage of widows across America. And we got this letter from a woman. She said, Brother Roberts, I am the widow that they're talking about. And since I joined your ministry and have been planting seed every month, I got a new house. I got a new car. My children are going to college. I'm the widow they're talking about. Well, and the media would say, you know, prophet takes last meal from widow. That's how CNN would report it. That's not what he was trying to do. He wasn't trying to get something from her. I mean, he had supernaturally been fed by ravens and drinking water from the brook. Don't you think he could have used his faith instead of trying to take something from a widow? No, he said, give me the first portion, for thus saith the Lord, if you will, your meal bearer will not diminish and your cruise of oil shall not fail. And if you study the Bible, you'll find that, that she cooked about a thousand meals out of that empty meal barrel and cruise of oil until the rains came and they could plant their crops and get a harvest again. He wasn't trying to get something from her. He was trying to get something to her. Why do we listen to the secular media? Why do we pay attention to all that nonsense? You know? Why do we listen to the critics? To those who, who say, well, God wants to keep you, keep you poor and keep you humble and so you have absolutely nothing. That's, that has nothing to do with the Bible whatsoever. Amen. It's God's will that you prosper in every area of your life. Amen. And I've got news. There is an end time transfer of wealth coming. Amen. The Bible says so and it's going to happen. Amen. Why? 
to help finance the end times harvest of souls. The world is not going to evangelize the world. It's going to take us. It's going to take people who believe in the principles of sowing and reaping so God can open windows of heaven. I'll get to that in a minute. But there's an end time transfer of wealth coming. And who's it going to come into? In whose hands is it going to come into? It's going to come into the hands of those who are sowers. Remember the story of the little red hen? No one wanted to, you know, to plant the wheat or crack the wheat or bake the wheat, but when it came time to eating, everybody wanted to eat the bread. You know, a lot of people talk about sowing, but not everybody sows. The latest statistic I saw, about 28% of Christians tithe nationally. That's a pretty small number. And most ministries that I know, most churches that I know, do not have as much money as they have vision. They have a big vision, and they don't have the finances to do it. They're trying to pay off debt. They're believing God for payroll. And they're not able to do all that God has put, them, put in their hearts. That's not right. We are to fulfill our vision. And as you study the Bible, you'll see this principle of sowing and reaping all the way through. And Israel had a tendency of being strong for God, and the next thing you know, they were worshiping idols of brass and wood and stone, and they had gone away from God. People like Jezebel brought uh, false gods into the nation, and people went away from their moorings. And God called on a man by the name of Malachi to talk to the people. And he stood before them and said, you've left me. You've left me. And the people had been so far away from God that they actually said, how have we left you? You know, you can be so far away from God that you don't even know you're away. How have we left you? They said. Or how have we left you? He said, you've left me in tithes and offerings. And he said, you're cursed with a curse. And that's what happens to us as Christians when we don't obey the Bible. But God never presents a problem without presenting the answer. Malachi said, bring your tithe and offering into the storehouse and prove me. You talk about a money back guarantee. <laughs> prove me. See if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so much so that there's not enough room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer, the devil, for your sake. Prove me now. Prove me. Put me to the test. See if I'm not who I say I am. Prove me. See if I will not open you the windows of heaven. Why would you have to open a window? Because it's shut. You don't have to open a window that's open. You open a window that's shut. I'll open you the windows of heaven only twice in the whole Bible. Is there a mention of windows in heaven? Once is in Noah's day, when God opened the windows of heaven and poured out a flood of rain for 40 days and 40 nights until everything was destroyed except for one family and two of each of the animals that were on the earth at that time. The only other time he mentioned windows of heaven is in Malachi chapter 3, when he said, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, a blessing, not a flood, but a blessing. I'll pour you out a blessing, so much so there won't be enough room to, to contain it. And then he said, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. I was sitting with my dad one night, and I said, Dad, what does rebuke mean? He said, in the original language, the word rebuke is translated, stop it. That's enough. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody say, stop it. Stop, stop it. it. That's enough. That's enough. Anybody here ever said that to a child? I said that to my youngest daughter, Chloe, until I was blue in the face. I wore out. Stop it. That's enough. <laughs> I said no so many times to that child. She's the one now we call Oral Roberts in a dress. 
I said no so many times. One time I said to her, what part of no don't you understand? She said the O. <laughs> the word rebuke means stop it. That's enough. And that's what happened when Jesus was asleep in the boat. And the disciples came to him and said, Master, don't you care that we're about to drown? And Jesus awakened, walked to the bow of the ship, put out his hands, and the Bible says he rebuked the winds and waves. What he literally said was, winds and waves, you stop it, that's enough. And there was a calm. And they made it to the other side where the Gadarene demoniac was. And the other time was when he went into Peter's home. And Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. And he went in and rebuked the fever. He literally spoke to the fever and said, You stop it, that's enough. And the woman was healed. Fixed him a fried chicken dinner. I'm sure it was fried chicken. With mashed potatoes and gravy. And a little corn. Is it lunchtime? <laughs> But that's what rebuke means. It means stop it, that's enough. He said, I'll not only open you the windows of heaven, but I'll pour you out a blessing, not a cursing, not a flood of destruction, but a blessing, so much so you won't have enough room to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer. I'll say to the devil, you stop it, that's enough. That's my child. You can't have them. And when you get your word in harmony with his word, then the devil doesn't have a chance. Let me tell you what, we're in a fight. We're in a battle. But it's a faith fight. And it's time to play dirty. Where do you put your seed? You put it in the ground. You put it in the dirt. Yeah. Time to fight dirty. Yeah. Time to fight dirty. Yeah. My grandfather used to tell me the story of how in the 1920s, in Depression days, when he was a sharecropper farming and pastoring in southeast Oklahoma. And one summer, a hailstorm hit. And in our part of the country, not unlike this part of the country, when hail comes, sometimes the hail is large. And that year, the hail was as big as softballs. And it destroyed the crop in the field literally beat the paint off their house. They lived in a little shotgun house. And my dad was still a boy. And my grandfather, as he told me the story, walked out on the porch after the storm was over and saw that the crop had been destroyed. And he knew what that meant. He knew that there would be no new school clothes. There'd be no new shoes. He wondered how he would pay his bills. And he began to weep. Now, my grandfather was a big man. He was six foot two, about two inches taller than me, as was my dad. I'm six feet. They were both six two. And they both had big hands, big men. And my grandfather began to weep. My grandmother, who was about five feet tall and about five feet wide, <laughs> came out on the porch. Her name was Claudius Priscilla, and my grandfather's name was Ellis Melville. And she came out on the porch and said, Ellis, go back in the house and get that $100 bill you've been hiding from me. <laughs> now, these were days of the, of the Great Depression. And uh, my grandfather kept a $100 bill hidden in the secret compartment of his wallet so that no one could call Reverend E. M. Roberts broke. And she said, Ellis, go get that $100 bill. Get Oral, my dad, Vaden, my uncle. 
hitch up the wagon. They didn't have a car. Drive into town, which is a couple of miles. Go to Jeter's feed store and buy seed. We're going to replant. My grandfather knew that in the natural, it was too late in the season to replant. The frost would come, the freeze would follow. It was a wasted effort. But he also knew enough not to argue with his Pentecostal wife. <laughs> and so he and my dad and my uncle got the wagon and went into town with that $100 bill in his overalls pocket. And when he got to the Jeter's feed store opening front door, Mr. Jeter came out on the porch and said, Mr. Roberts, how did your farm do in the storm? And my grandfather said, Mr. Jeter, the crop's gone. And he said, yes, all the crops in this area are gone. And my grandfather pulled that $100 bill out of his pocket and said, we've come to buy seed. We're going to replant. And Mr. Jeter just stood there and laughed at him because he knew it was too late in the season. And something changed, so my grandfather said. Mr. Jeter changed and said to his sons, who were also standing there, drive Brother Robert's wagon around to the back to the big feed doors and fill their wagon with seed. Take that hundred dollars. They're going to replant. And they drove the wagon around, filled it with seed, and the next morning, my grandmother, my grandfather, my, my dad, my, my, my uncles and aunts, and their children, and all the Roberts kinfolk that, kinfolk that were in the area started replanting. By that time, the word had reached the others in the community. And the other farmers came and lined the fence posts to laugh and mock and watch the stupidity of a family that would replant, replant that late in the season. But my family just kept their head down, planting in the dirt. Funny thing happened that year in Oklahoma. The frost was unusually late. And the first freeze didn't come till almost the end of November. And only one farm in that area got a harvest. It was the Roberts farm. My dad used to call that the seed of the equivalent benefit. That when something strikes you, that's the time to sow. May not look like the right time. Maybe in the natural it seems like it's all lost. But that's the time to get down in the dirt. That's the time to fight dirty. And whenever God wants to raise an empire from its hinges, he has a baby born. And that's how Jesus came into the world and entered his, his own public ministry, teaching on the principles of sowing and reaping. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And uh, he put together a group of ramshackle men who some were failures, some were outcasts, some were hated tax collectors, some were fishermen, some were zealots, some were about half with him. <laughs> kind of reminds me a lot of church members. Uh, 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 some other churches. He was on his way into Capernaum to preach. Big crowd was following. He looked down and he saw a man washing and mending his nets. His name was Simon Peter. And he took a look at Peter and took a look at that empty fishing boat and knew the story. You know, Jesus had the gifts of the Spirit operating in his life. And he walked over to Simon and said, uh, Loan me your boat. Now, you've got to know the Bible is a synopsis. Uh, 
It's a synopsis of what happened. I mean, the, all the books in the world, all the libraries in the world couldn't contain the books of what really happened. It's a synopsis. So you have to know there's something going on between the scriptures. There's got to be some conversations. And you imagine the conversation that must have ensued. Something like, well, what do you want my boat for? You know? I mean, and, that, and that's the question you'd ask, what do you want my boat for? Well, you're obviously not a fisherman. What do you want my boat for? Well, I needed to preach. I don't have a place to preach. Loan me your boat. Let me use your boat. What he was saying to him was, sow a seed into my ministry. And let me take that seed and use it for the glory of God. And then let me multiply it back to you. That's what he was saying, really. Well, Jesus, that's my, that's my boat. That's, my, that's the best of God. And Jesus must have said something like, well, it's empty, isn't it? Peter gave up his excuses and said okay and loaned him his boat and Jesus preached and no doubt did miracles because wherever he went he preached, he taught and he healed so he must have done miracles because the Bible speaks of the miracles he did in Capernaum then he came back to him and said now now that you've sown that seed launch out into the deep waters and let down your nets for a catch and Peter began once again to rehearse his excuses. We have fished all night, and we have taken nothing. We've kept all the rules, all the regulations of fishing. In the Sea of Galilee at that time, they only fished in the dark of the moon at night because the waters are crystal clear. And if you were to throw a net over the side of the boat, the fish would see it and swim the other way. And also, they did not go out into the deep waters they only fished along the shore because the boats that they had in those days were not strong enough to withstand the storms that could hit the Sea of Galilee because the Sea of Galilee is 200 feet below sea level and is subject to violent storms almost without notice and if they were to be caught out in the middle of that lake they would not have time perhaps to get to the shore before they were capsized and they could drown so they fished at night and Peter had kept all the rules. We did everything right, Jesus, and we didn't get even a bite. Now you're telling me, launch out into the deep. You must not know much about fishing. <laughs> Jesus said, I'll get in the boat with you. And Peter half-heartedly said, I'll do what you say. Right. Yeah. Nevertheless, because you say so, I'll do it. But notice what he said. I will let down the net. Jesus has said, let down your nets. Peter said, I'll let down the net. Now, I don't know which net he was talking about. Perhaps he had already washed and mended other nets, and now he had this one net that he wasn't going to wash and wasn't worrying about mending. Maybe it was full of holes. I don't know. It doesn't say. But whatever it was, that's the net he was going to use. And you know, Jesus will let you make your excuses. And he'll still get in your boat with you. But you may not get the same result if you had gone all the way with him. And that's exactly what happened. They got out there on the water. And he who created the fish spoke to the fish. Hit that net. And suddenly Peter felt that tug on his shoulders. And he began hauling the net in. First thing you know, the net broke. Oh my God. <laughs> Why didn't I listen? Why didn't I use my, my best nets? I got this old holy one here. <laughs> and I don't mean H-O-L-Y. <laughs> and the fish are, oh my God, that's a $10 fish woman right there, that net, look at that. He turned to Jesus and said, Master, Master, I, I blew it. I, I'm, I'm a sinful man, I didn't listen. Jesus said, get up, I'll make something of your life called on his partners in the other ship and they had their nets the Bible says they came over and their nets were filled he still got a net breaking boat sinking load but he could have got a lot more if he'd paid full attention and that's where many of us are today we get a word from God and fear strikes us and we wonder how we're going to do certain things how are we going to, how are we going to make it when God says plant a seed because immediately Satan comes in to steal the seed and to mess with our minds. That's the battlefield. 
That's where Satan comes to attack us. But I'm telling you, that when you learn how to make your life a seed, your love, your time, your money, your prayers, your smiles, your compassion, a good word, a pat on the back, all of that is a seed. And as you sow it unto the Lord through people, through ministries, God is obligated then to watch over his word. He said, when you do that, I will open you the windows of heaven. I'll pour you out a blessing, so much so there will not be enough room to receive it. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you again. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give to your bosom. For with the same measure you give, it will be given to you again. And God demonstrated this principle when he said in John 3.16 that I love the world so much that I gave my only begotten son so that men would not perish but have everlasting life. And here's where so much of the church over the years has had a problem. That you're not supposed to expect anything back. But God expected something back. He gave that he might receive us back. He gave us the formula. He gave his son so that men would not perish. He gave that he might receive mankind whom he had lost in the Garden of Eden. He gave that he might receive. And to do anything less than that, than to do what he did, is wrong. It's not scriptural. So when you plant a seed, you have a Bible right for God to use that seed for his glory. And then multiply it back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You should expect it. I love to tell the story about how if I get thirsty, if I'm in a hotel, and there's a Coca-Cola machine down the hall, I'll go get some coins, and I'll go down the hall. And I'll see what's on the machine. You know, you know they have different drinks. And I'll put my money in. You know, and then I'll make my selection. You know what I do next? I reach down to receive. put my money in I make my request and I reach down to receive you want to tell me why we treat a Coca-Cola machine better than God and somebody said well that's sacrilegious no it's not God gave that he might get us back I put that money in, which means I have a covenant. I got a contract with Coca-Cola. It's not Dr. Pepper, but it's Coke. It's better if it's a Dr. Pepper machine, but it's a Coke. Okay? Most hotels have Coca-Cola. Okay? But nevertheless, I got a contract with that company. When I put my money in, make my selection, I got a right. Put my hand out to receive. And what do you do if it doesn't work? You kick the machine, right? A lot of people kicking God. Because you didn't do it on your schedule, didn't do it on your agenda, didn't do it exactly the way you wanted it. But I got news, when he does it, it's 10 times better than anything you ever thought of. My God, when I asked you to pull it out of me this morning, I didn't think you would pull all this out. Could you squeeze a little less? My God, you're getting everything in me. My grandfather, (laughs) my grandfather was quite a case. He, he, as I said, he was a big man and he had a big voice. He didn't need a microphone. Uh, He would preach and my grandmother would get up and follow him and pray for the sick. And he'd get people saved, and she'd get them healed. They were quite a pair. And when my dad entered his uh, healing ministry, uh, they, they kind of had a revival in their own lives, and they went out on the field again as husband and wife. And they were quite a pair. He, 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 he'd had this booming voice, and he'd preach, and then she'd get up, and within 30 seconds, she'd have the whole congregation in tears. 
She was just that way. She, had, she was so powerful. And then she prayed for the sick and, and had miracles. But uh, as I said, they were, they were farmers and pastors in southeast Oklahoma. And one day, uh, one of the ranchers in their church brought a live chicken to their front door as an offering. Now, in those days, uh, farmers would oftentimes give what they used to call poundings. Uh, they, because they didn't, have, they didn't have a lot of money till harvest time came, so they'd give offerings of food. And they were called pounding. These are a food that they'd put up, you know, they canned. And uh, so this chicken rancher brought a, a live chicken to give to my grandfather and grandmother as an offering. And he left, and uh, they took the chicken in, and, and they're going to kill it and eat it. And a little while later, uh, before they killed it, the, the chicken rancher came driving up in his truck again, honking on the horn and, and beating on the door, and said, Brother Roberts, have you killed that chicken yet? And my grandfather said, well, no, not yet. We're going to. He said, well, did you notice that the chicken I gave you had only one eye? And my grandfather said, well, we noticed it had only one eye. And he said, well, as I drove home, the Lord spoke in my heart and convicted me that I should not give the Lord a chicken that has only one eye. I shouldn't give him my worst chicken. I should give him my best chicken. And so I brought you a chicken with two eyes. And I want you to give me that chicken with one eye. And they exchanged chickens. Now I can hear my grandfather telling me that story. And I wonder how many Christians today are giving God their one-eyed chickens. It's close to home, doesn't it? You know, I won't miss this. <laughs> I won't miss it. Uh, I won't miss it. It, it. So I'll just give it to God. That's a one-eyed chicken. Well, I got news. If it doesn't mean something to you, it's certainly not going to mean anything to God. Makes me wonder how many people have been giving God their one-eyed chickens. Everybody look straight ahead. Don't look left or right. First murder in the world was over a one-eyed chicken. Cain killed his brother because Abel gave of his first fruit. He gave the best. Cain gave when he got around to it. It meant nothing to Cain. And because it meant nothing to Cain, it meant nothing to God. And God rejected Cain's and accepted Abel's. And Cain rose up and killed his brother over a one-eyed chicken. And I wonder today how many people are giving God their one-eyed chickens. I won't miss this. I don't need this. I'll give it to God. Acting so holy so pious so sanctimonious with God saying I'll spit you out of my mouth I grew up on a ranch we had cattle we had horses had a little three acre pond that I loved to fish in we had some chickens and had about 300 acres and uh, we had a couple of milk cows and when I got old enough they let me milk the cows which I thought was great. Had a little stool. We didn't have any automation in those days. Had a little stool. I got under that cow, and I would milk that cow, and I had the greatest time. Uh, other, other, others would come and help me, and we'd get into milk fights. <laughs> we'd be next to one another, and we'd go like this, and we'd go, <laughs> come home soaked. And they'd take all that milk and put it in those containers in the barn refrigerator. And the next morning, my mother and I would come down to get that milk, and take it back to the house. And she'd put that milk up on the counter and set me up on the counter. And she would say, look, son, look. The cream has risen to the top. And she would say, 
That's the best part, the cream. And she would say to me, son, when you give to God, don't reach down off the bottom. Give off the top. Cream is the best. Give of the cream. Don't reach down to the bottom. Give off the top. Give your best. And then ask God for his best. Don't you want God's best? The only way you're going to get God's best is when you give him your best. Plant your seed. three key principles in that book that I signed for you yesterday number one God is your source number two plant your seed and number three expect a miracle now that's the first part of this message tonight you're going to get the rest okay I have been sufficiently squeezed <laughs> So I'm going to go and pour some more liquid in <laughs> so I can be squeezed tonight. Amen. But let me give you a word. Let me apologize in advance for what God is going to do to you tomorrow. I take no responsibility for what's going to happen in this place tomorrow night and tomorrow morning because I'm going to share how my life was transformed through the joy of the Lord. And when I do, all heaven is going to break loose. You better bring your seatbelt. You may need a pillow because you may be here a while. You don't want to miss tonight or tomorrow morning or tomorrow night. Squeeze me. Take everything you can. Get it all. I don't want to. I don't want to take a drop home with me. You see, I'm looking. I'm looking to God as my source. I'm not looking to you. People don't make good sources. People are instruments. I remember once we got a pastor. We got a letter once from a man who sent a large check to our ministry. And he said, Brother Roberts, I'm sowing this seed because God told me, but don't think I'm sowing it because I like you. <laughs> and I read it, I thought, isn't that amazing? He said, I don't like you. But God spoke to me, told me to send this. He said, you're going to want to send it back, but don't. Just remember, I don't like you. <laughs> it's the truth, I read the letter. Well, that was... Uh, that was Luke 6.38. He said that God will give back to you through men. May not know you, may not like you, but they'll be compelled. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. You don't look to the man or the woman, you look to God. Let God choose the instrument. You look to him. He's the author, he's the finisher of your faith. Everybody say, seed, seed time, time, harvest. Praise God. Give the Lord praise today. Hallelujah.